All right. So to get things going, I'm going to start with a question, and then uh, you know, hopefully that will warm things up, and uh, then we'll turn it over to you. Oh, they're ask. warm. Oh, okay. That's good. That's good. So uh, to all of you, uh, one of the takeaways, at least for me, from watching the documentary and attending the panels today was this somewhat naive, maybe, perhaps naive conclusion that the way in which the business model of media uh, and social pa platforms is designed is such that it is conducive to monetizing disinformation. It seems that uh, that type of content is what turns eyeballs, right? And as a result, you know, as a result of this business model, one then has to think about potential solutions that might emerge. And I'm just curious to get your initial thoughts on what are some avenues that we could potentially explore to mitigate uh, this phenomenon? Um, just to jump in, uh, it's just kind of two questions. They're good, but there's two of them there. Um, the first one, uh, in terms of these platforms and their, you know, I wouldn't say they're conducive to, to monetizing disinformation as much as they're they're somewhat built to monetize disinformation. Um, you know, part of the, I think one of the things that we discovered while we were doing our research, and we talked to a lot of engineers at Google and other places, current and former, um, was the very obvious uh, idea that it's really a business model issue. There are obviously algorithms at work in any technologically run platform that's kind of rudimentary um, but I think it's a bit of a misnomer to blame everything on this sort of Oz-like black box algorithm and it's really a very old business model we were talking about this earlier it's very much like yellow journalism you know which is over a hundred years old where you have Hearst and Pulitzer fighting each other over who can pump out more intentionally inaccurate world news to monetize their individual outlets to beat their competitor. Um, now you have this with four and a half billion views a day. So it's, um, I don't know, I think the tail wags the dog. I think that it's disingenuous to say uh, it's the end user, bad, few bad apples. I think that it, it is you know, a large part of the business model itself. The solution is a whole other thing, but I'll let Sander talk about that. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the truth is when you discover and you own a business that what is most successful in monetization is getting people emotionally engaged toward anger and rage and not pet videos or, you know, or watching how to fix your refrigerator when it goes out, which is, which is my first exposure to, to YouTube, um, you are going to make sure that your, the algorithm that you design, that doesn't design itself, is going to give people that content because the way they monetize it is based on, on how long each individual viewer spends on the platform. Um, so it, it, is, it is designed to maximize the profit for the shareholder. And we live in a capitalist society where it's going to be very difficult for something, for someone to voluntarily leave money on the table. Right. And just as a follow up on that, given that, uh, uh, given what we know uh, from academic research, specifically over the past couple of years, the emergence of socially responsible investors. Do you see a potential role that shareholders or major block holders in these, uh, in these companies, their ultimate owners, what responsibility I mean, I, would they I, I have? I think we're in a room of accountants and I think they're probably better equipped to answer that, but I would say that the activist shareholders who want to maximize shareholder value are the ones that generally replace the boards and CEOs, not the other way around. I, I, I defer to those of you who study these things, but, but I believe that the activists who are maximizing shareholder value. There, there, there's also a lot of mechanisms in place in any business to protect certain elements of that business, right? So you can have people within a, a business who are shielded or are 
willfully shielded from some of the messier aspects of how their business is run, including this kind of socially conscious, social impact sort of uh, agenda or seeming agenda. Um, but the reality of it is, is there's an enormous amount of work being done by all of these companies uh, through lobbying and through other very specific acts that take a great deal of money and time to prevent anyone from litigating or legislating or regulating or even looking under the hood and having any transparency about what is actually going on. And that uh, precludes the, the, you know, the ability to call someone out for that kind of behavior. There's so many layers before you get to what's actually going on. And that was one of the things that we wanted to just kind of continue. That's the thing I like about film is, is it can be relentless. Like you can just keep explaining the thing and showing it and showing it and showing it by way of characters. Um, you know, just, just to kick it to Sandra, cause I was, you know, I read his book, which I very much enjoyed. And, and the thing that I like for me, the solutions are to get to your second question. Um, I mean, we come right out and say it in the movie. I think primarily we're dealing with a, with an industrial revolution via technology. That's pretty evident at this point. We know how we dealt with the last one. That's how we're going to have to deal with this one, right? We're going to, this is standard oil, right? And we are going to have to break them up. And they are not going to police themselves, despite what they just told Biden last week. And Biden was like, all right, have fun. Go police yourself, um, which is terrible. Um, so that's not going to work. And it's going to take a lot of time because they have a lot of lobbying power. But I think, you know, in the meantime, there are solutions. And I think a lot of those are behavioral um, and, you know, there are ways to protect the end user, I mean, I call it the end user because that's what they call it, it's a horrible term, but to protect the people who are on these platforms because no one's going to get off of them. Um, there are things that can be done, but I think that the long-term goal is to, to treat these companies as, as the monopolies that they are. Sandra, your thoughts? Yeah, I would just add to that that, you know, I think partly, you know, having a fantastic film like this is is what's needed to raise awareness so that people, you know, I think to some extent you have to leverage the mechanism of, of the, the types of market in which these companies operate, right? They're responding sometimes to what the end users want, right? And so what they're seeing often that's reflected in the algorithms is the is the demand-driven behavior. Um, it's really interesting because when you talk to a lot of these companies, they'll say like, well, we're just we're just observing what people do on the platform, and they they engage more with extremist content, so we give them more, and and uh, and and you know it's it's kind of a re in, in for the economists in the room a revealed preference situation. People are showing us their behavior, right? But they're not so cognizant of the fact that when you actually ask people outside of the platform what they want, they say we don't want this. Um, so the stated preference is something for an entirely different kind of social media. Um, and so we all know that you know when you get stuck in a flame war on on, on Facebook or YouTube in the comment section, like you're going to respond, you're going to click. But um, a lot of people say they don't enjoy that and they don't want that sort of content. And so, you know, I think holding for, for people to hold social media companies accountable, I think, is the individual kind of behavior that, that we need that's ultimately hopefully going to lead to more um, systematic change. And for that, people need to be informed. And I think, you know, having having uh, Alex and Gil produce uh, a film like this is incredibly important in, in, in giving people the tools they need to demand uh, the types of changes that are going to be reflected in, in demand. Just as when companies produce uh, materials that are h harmful to, to society or the environment or to, to populations in certain countries and customers decide they no longer want to buy the product, that's when, when partly when change happens. And sure, you can do top down with regulation, but you know, by the time that happens, you know, so I think it's also useful for people to start demanding that change. Yeah, and the one will drive the other, right? You're never yeah. going to get to the regulation if there isn't a, a massive outcry from the populace. It just won't, it will be no incentive for government to take action. So it has to, it has to be a citizen driven thing that begins to accumulate. You know, the only thing I would say to that is that there's a, there is a, a level of, of bad faith in, in the argument from, from these companies that you know, they're just providing what people want um, because so much effort goes into uh, to promoting and specifically pushing content that they know is is going to create an emotional reaction and keep people on platform and and what drives that. And, you know, one 
I was talking to someone earlier, I didn't want to make this a whistleblower movie, but I had a lot of people from Google and YouTube reaching out to me going, they're going to hate you for saying that their platform has a societal impact because that's the big no-no in the company. You can't say that we have societal impact. Like, you can't say that. And of course they do, <laughs> right? They have societal impact. It's not just ba a bad apple or the fact that, the, that you know, we live in ancient Rome and it's the audience in the Colosseum and they want to see someone's head get ripped off. Um, these this type of platform is driving this type of content that is having an impact on society. All right, I think this is a good point to kind of revert it and turn it to the audience, please. I, I really enjoyed the movie, but I didn't see this like feedback that seems to be really important. A lot, a lot of it was just this first order effect of the algorithm is showing people this, and that leads to people getting affected by it. But it seems like someone like Alex Jones, who appeared frequently, and several of the others, they see what is getting more clicks and likes and hat sales and pillow sales and whatever. And, and I'm just curious if that that came up in, in your consistent background research and like. How big are the financial incentives to, to, to be? Well, sure. It's a, it's a very good question. I mean, I think, I think we do address it, actually, because what, what I was most interested in wasn't the, the feedback loop in terms of, say, you're Steven Crowder, and I just said X, and I got this great reaction, so now I'm going to say X a, a lot. Um, so much as, and I think we, we spend a good deal of time talking about this, Tal Lavin has a whole run on it. Um, these are not golly gee whiz influencers. There's a difference between Natalie Wynn and Shapiro or Crowder or Owens, right? Natalie Wynn is literally, as we saw, a woman who lives in a brown townhouse in Baltimore with like her own setup, who's completely, who doesn't even monetize off YouTube intentionally. These folks are like giant dark money politically funded entities pretending to be golly gee whiz folks, there's a, there is a, there's a political ag agenda at work in, in a lot of what's going on in terms of who's being monetized by and heavily funded by very politically motivated operatives. Jones was hugely useful to a lot of high powered entities, which is why he was able to grow to the degree that he did. Now the same can be said for Rogan, Crowder is still on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's a lot of money behind these people. Um, so I didn't want to misrep, I didn't, I was in, I was a little concerned because it's a big thread of a big sweater, that, what you're raising, right? And you could make a whole movie just about influencers really easily. Um, but I think we did a pretty good job of explaining what I think is the, what matters here, which is the sort of deception that on the one hand you have Google that may not have a political agenda necessarily, but certainly a monetary agenda. And on the other side, you have, this is bad marriage, right? You have these very, very ideologically driven, dark money funded influencers that aren't really influencers. They're really political ideologues. And those two are working together with an algorithm like lightning, like, you know, like gasoline on a fire. And I think that is really the bigger issue for me. Um, it's not to d discount what you're saying, because there's a lot, of, like, I. I could have spent the whole movie talking about just children and the lack of regulation and, you know, there's so many different things going on. But I think the idea of that interplay between, because that's what got us to January 6th, which was very intentional, and that was a win for that side. And they drove it, and they drove it, and they drove it till they got there. Um, that, to me, is where the danger lies in that marriage, more so than just, you know, like an influence who's like, oh, I'm going to do more of this stuff because it gets me more eyeballs. I hope that's clear, but that was, that was the thinking anyway. Thanks for the great movie. It was really interesting to watch. I'm a foreign, I was a journalist. I'm now working for public broadcaster management. So two questions. I understood that the next step in one way or another will be regulation. So what is the most specific thing when it comes to regulation that is literally around the corner or would that we... You know, what could be the next thing in regulation? I know it seems to be far away, but what is the most specific thing and where could it happen next? So where will we see a big step? Well, antitrust would be the, would be the long-term, antitrust would be the long-term goal. Okay. And my next question combined with it, I, I guess it's a certain way of censorship or a certain way of, you know, blocking videos that are bad. Yes or no? I mean, it's been done before. 
the, the, the issue becomes what is free speech, what is hate speech, yeah. what's protected speech. And, you know, I, I, there was a fantastic session today which essentially talked about how each jurisdiction, each country, the European Union, the UK, the US, all have different rules. Um, and, um, and I do believe that it's unlikely to start in the US. I think it is far more likely to start in the UK or the EU, probably the EU. And, um, and at that point, the platforms will have a really difficult time saying they can't do something. Yeah. Um, they have, for many, many years, said they can't take down certain things, that they don't have the technological capability to do it. You know, they didn't want to take down child porn. They were saying that that was a slippery slope. And, um, you know, so, so really, I, I, I do believe it's likely to start in the EU and then and then hopefully there will be enough political will. Hopefully it won't be an election year uh, because it's very difficult to get anything major done in an election, a presidential election year. Um, and with enough people aware of the problem, as Alex was saying. That would be my second question, if I may. The more we regulate or, in a way, delete or censor videos, do we have psych psychologically that effect that people even more think, oh, wow, this is part of a bigger conspiracy theory. That's why well, they're, they're going to think that anyway. That's the real truth. They, they, they already think <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, maybe um, a reference to your pearly gate uh, sort of example. My, my pearly gates yeah, yes, uh, yeah, joke, yeah. my dad joke. Yeah, yeah. no, it, 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 um, uh, it does have, so what worries me is there, there's two sort of findings on this. One, deplatforming super spreaders of misinformation is highly effective on the platform that you, that you, that you kicked them off. So the, there's been analysis of Trump since he left Twitter and misinformation went down drastically after they removed some of the super spreaders. The problem is that he then goes on and starts his own social media platform where people become even more extreme in their own echo chamber. It becomes more fragmented. They start ranting about unmoderated free speech. They start collecting themselves, radicalizing themselves. And so the, the question then becomes, you know, what is a good balance between removing harmful content and not allowing people to, to, to spew speech that could harm others uh, versus them doing it elsewhere. So I think as Gil said, maybe they, they, they would have done it anyway, um, right? Because they're motivated to, to spread their message. Um, but psychologically, sometimes you do get this backfire effect on, on you know, free speech activists and that politicizes the, the debate. And so it, it is a, it, it's a tricky problem to address because they're going to say, you know, it becomes part of the conspiracy. Like, see the mainstream. Now we're talking about mainstream social media, which is censoring, censoring them. And they have to go to Rumble and, and, and you know, um, some of these platforms that offer unmoderated. Uh, and it's so interesting because since the history... Those are a lot smaller, though. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, there's no comparison in scale between YouTube and That's Rumble. That's true. They're, they're much smaller, especially compared to, uh, to, to YouTube. Yeah. So it's or a, it's or Trump's off. platform, which was a total disaster <laughs> yeah uh, yeah I think truth social is ranked uh, is ranked pretty low amongst the uh, I think rumble is probably the biggest uh, but comparatively they're 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 fairly small so I think it's you know it's a, yeah it's a it's a trade-off but there's I, I mean I would just say though that that I don't think that's the solution anyway like I don't think I mean I think I don't think that that what the the outcry that's valid is right now is primarily about censorship. Um, I think that that can be a bad faith argument from the, the extremist right. You know, how Musk keeps talking about himself as a free speech maximalist. And the day he took over Twitter, he booted most of the anti-fascist and left-wing organizations off the platform and silenced half of the progressive movement that was on Twitter. Um, I think that that, in fact, going further, I think, you know, I'm particularly very concerned about regulation of the Internet. I'm not a huge fan of the DSA and other some of the other regulation I've seen out of the EU. I think there's big problems with it. Um, I think that it's unsafe for a lot of people. It, it de-anonymizes people who need to remain anonymous. It can often we were talking about this earlier, but it can often be the, not the hardest, not on the big corporations, but on 
the LGBTQ community, on children, on marginalized groups, on people in foreign countries, and and generally we're dealing with this in the U.S. right now, where there's all this promise of all this regulation that's coming, but it's scary because it doesn't sound particularly well thought out, and it can cause more harm than good. So. I wouldn't be glib and just be like, oh yeah, hell yeah, let's just go regulate the internet, right? Like, I don't think we should turn off Section 230, it'd be a disaster, right? For all of the people who, who are marginalized, not for the big companies. So these are really complex and thorny issues, but the problem I have is that there's so much bad faith in the tech space around what they're doing we're, and we need to be able to have honest narratives about what they're doing, and we're not even there yet. Their lobbying power is so strong, you can't say anything about most of these companies, um, and we'll get no oxygen, like with the media, with institutions. So I just think that, that you have to start by having very aggressive, honest conversations about their business model. Look, they deplatformed Stefan Molyneux, who was responsible for the Christchurch shooting, right? That's great. I don't think, you know, if somebody was complaining that they, were, <laughs> they had st censored Stefan Molyneux, then, you know, there are, you know, the level of extremism that supports that kind of content is actually fairly small, like in terms of the scope of the population. Um, so I'm, I'm less worried about having the conversation around what are the harms that are being caused and why are these harms being caused? Because right now, when you have those conversations, what you get back is, hey, we just put stuff on the platform and advertise it, and you know our advertisers would never want to be attached to bat. Like, it's just nonsense, right? It's just, it's not even true. Um, so I think you have to start with a, with a, a an honest dialogue. What I you know, would like about what people like Sander are doing is like, you know, you start doing case studies of populations, you start, it's really important to get your hands around the facts. Like in the US, there's this crazy kind of red scare hysteria that like, that children shouldn't be online, right? I mean, I've raised three boys online. Their kids are fine online. Um, the APA, uh, American Psychiatric, Psychiatric, right? A little tired, so I don't wanna get that wrong. Thank you. They, they did a study last year, that an extensive study that showed that the internet was primarily neutral for kids that the negatives were not that extreme, the positives were not that extreme. It was pretty much a flatline neutral that leaned towards the positive. The media in the US flipped those results when they told that story and literally said that the APA study did the opposite of what the APA said it did. So they could strengthen this narrative that like, oh my God, kids on the internet, oh, you know, satanic panic. And that's what we're up against. It's like, it's just a lack of basic facts. And so I think that's where you gotta start. I think doing real case studies, getting your arms around what the harms are, calling these tech companies out about what they're doing, then you begin to get, then to you know, wind all the way back to your question, which is kind of the question, the best way to deal with this is gonna reveal itself in many, many ways. Uh, and I don't think it means a shackling or a censoring of the internet in a meaningful way at the end of the day. Yep. Uh, Jenny, Jenny, uh, a microphone back there also. Okay. No, was, you took his like mic away. Uh, no. <laughs> That's deep censorship. Deep platform, deep, deep platform. platform. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for taking my question. Uh, first of all, great film. I learned so much from the film. Um, I, having a, you know, having a three-year-old, I was deeply concerned after seeing that footage about the um, um, really. <laughs> unsavory um, films being marketed to children, but coming well, to now, but, Harry's yeah. earlier um, question about incentives, so I can see and understand political groups funding extreme videos, but these kind of really, to me, grotesque uh, videos that encourage children to kill themselves, I mean, who, and, and they apparently are made quite well, technically, and and somehow managed to game the system to, to be recommended, to be viewed. So, so who are making these and, and who are funding the making of these? And, yeah. and if YouTube is a advertise, you know, advertiser-sponsored you know, platform, 
then surely Mattel or you know, any sort of toy company who would advertise for children's content should not want to be associated with this grotesque uh, video of children uh, trying to kill themselves. It's a really good question. I can answer it pretty quickly. For, first of all, to be clear, that stuff is gone. YouTube got rid of it. It was, it was a, a byproduct of the recommender algorithm when they first put that up went bananas. When I, when I shot with Caleb Kane, we shot in the, in the Watergate Hotel, just to be cheeky. Um, when we shot with him in the hotel room, the very first thing I did, which didn't make it into the movie, was I sat him down with a laptop, and, and I was like, okay, let's see if now, in this sort of post-YouTube tinkering with the recommended algorithm, you can get rabbit holed anymore. And he couldn't. And he knew that he came, I mean, he knew. I mean, I knew too. But, like, they fixed a lot of that stuff. It, it's much harder to go online to YouTube and looking for fuzzy slippers and then be like joining a white supremacist organization like an hour later, which back in those days was what would happen to you more, more rapidly. Uh, the, the, to be fair, like the Momo thing was a hoax. The kids putting all that animation, people putting an animation on was largely trolling by like, by like bored hacker kids who just wanted to be radical and you know mess with stuff the reason it's in the film and the reason i think it's important is youtube isn't a social media platform like i was saying in the beginning right it's not social media it's your tv it's your it's your music it's your entertainment it's your news it's your search it's your archive so to answer your question i think that the reason that advertisers are, are quick to stay with the the is A, they get a lot of eyeballs, like more than anything else by an order of magnitude, but also they're, they, so, they so seldom understand how the platform actually works that they don't really know that like, oh, all the way over here there's this crazy stuff going on, even on the kids' side. I'm just over here where there's this little cool dude named Ryan who has nine billion views a week, right? I want, I want in on that. And even Ryan's parents were honest. They're like, look, this is the wild west. There's no regulation here at all. And that to me is, is crazy, that we don't deal with this platform as we would our, a, a TV channel. There's no standards and practices. There's no basic sort of regulation. Um, and I think that is, is dangerous, but it also is you know, it's their incentive because it allows them to have whatever they want on, on the platform. Yes, speaking of incentives, though, because maybe they were not you know, advertised, you know, they, 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 there weren't deep pocketed groups supporting those videos to start with, perhaps it's easier for you to shut them down because there is not that much money out there. Yeah, but there is. I mean, I don't know if you guys read, and I'll, the, I'll, I'll turn this back over in a second, but I mean, there's, there's so much stuff going on right now, but I don't know if, if any of you read, like within the last two weeks, Google was called on the carpet for having like an 85% inaccurate reporting of where their eyeballs were going. In other words, people were buying, are buying advertising and it's just being thrown on like the, the most salacious, politically horrific crap. And Google's like, oh, no, no, it's cool. <laughs> but, the, but it's all data. So you can, you can metric this stuff really easily. And it was some ridiculous number, like 80 or 85% of, of, of a rerouting of, of this ad money going into content that they knew was going to get lots of eyeballs, but was often pretty garbagey and not what some of these advertisers wanted to have their, their names associated with. So, yeah. So we should give it back. <laughs> I'm fighting for the guy who had the mic taken away. <laughs> you have been replatformed, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah, no, I just wanna, I mean, this is great. Superb movie, great discussion. And I just wanna link this whole concern about censorship to what you're talking about. Uh, when you mentioned the algorithms and how easily they're, they're being fixed. And the reason I think we have to draw the connection is that what the free speech fundamentalists like, you know, Musk are, are trying to make us think is that there is no information management at the moment on the internet and that it is free. Well, it's not. It is under corporate control. Right. And so the issue is not one of introducing censorship. The issue is of whether content management should be in the hands of private corporations yep. that are driven by profit or under public control. Yep. And I would suggest that if 30 years ago somebody had said in any Western democracy, oh, I'm gonna design a machine 
government dictates the information diet of all our publics by 10 people in Silicon Valley who are making money out of showing you dreadful stuff, you know, people would have thought I was barking mad to even propose that. And it is only because of the evolution of the technology that we are where we are. But I think it's important to realize that and to sort of step back from this and say, whoa, you know, this is not something any democracy would have designed. And I think that's... Yeah, Natalie Wynn makes the point very clearly in the movie, which I find myself saying every flipping day. It's just like it's, it's not about the First Amendment if you're dealing with a private corporation. A private corporation can do whatever the hell it wants with what is on its, con on its platform. It's, it's just a bad faith. I mean, it's either you're either confused or it's a bad faith argument. But that, I mean, that was Musk's, Musk kept saying, oh, Twitter's the town square, it's the town square. I mean, he's a clod in many ways, but he's not stupid, right? And he took control of that thing and immediately started harnessing who got to talk and who didn't get to talk. Because he's well aware that it's a private company that he now controls. And he controls the flow of speech on that company. And he also said it's, it's you know, bad to influence people. And then the next tweet was that we should all vote for the conservative Republican Party. Yeah. Uh, um, um. Yeah. And certain replatform people that were causing harms. My name is Eliani Abdurrahman from Harvard. I just want to build upon what you said earlier, sir, um, and I completely agree. I think the, one of the things that we also need to look at is not just the companies in their own individual capacities, but also what's happening in terms of extremists. For example, 4chan and 8chan, you have extremists using 4chan or 8chan as a playground, and they egg on each other and learn from each other, and then they move to the mainstream media. So, for example, when I was being harassed, indirectly harassed by Elon Musk, and I got the FBI involved in my case, you know, the question really was to ask, I, I can't see what's happening on, Bright, on Breitbart or Fortune, or 8chan that needs to be monitored and needs to be looked at, because this harassment actually sometimes can be coordinated, or, or it could be organic. I think in my case, I think it was organic. But a lot of the cases are actually coordinated. And so how is this spillover happening? And I'll give you a concrete example, because my specialty is actually online child, child safety. So this guy called Mini Lad on, on YouTube, so he does all these Minecraft videos. So he actually confessed on Twitter that he uh, was sexting and grooming children. And, and he's, he goes by Craig Thompson, it's actually his real name. So there was a huge Twitter storm, and he left the platform. But then he did come back to YouTube, and, started, and still, because there's this question that keeps on going every day, uh, that keeps on going in this conference, you are monetizing the, uh, the stuff that you get from the audience. If you leave one platform, you can still go on to Palais or Breitbart or other places and YouTube and still monetize your content. That's what he continued to do. So as soon as I got information, I, I you know, told people whose, whose sons I know were playing with Minecraft because this guy did say, I'm a pedophile and I will monetize my stuff and, and get your kids' attention on Minecraft. And that to me is very disturbing because we need to look at this cross-platform migration work and that's not really being addressed. Yeah. Thoughts? Any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, Senator, do you want to, before I jump in? I could, I'm happy to. No, feel free to okay. kick it off. Um, I mean, I do think that it's, it's being, it's much more known publicly now than it was, you know, back in the Gamergate days, which I think is really when that became the most evident public-facing example of harassment mostly targeted at women um, via different channels that all congregated together and, and unified. Um, and I think that, that, again, not to draw it all back to politics, but you know, the, the Gamergate was really latched onto by Bannon and other entities on the right who realized that they could weaponize these fragmented communities and unify them across platforms. And that was a big part of how we got to, to January 6th. And uh, I think that that's one of my biggest fears moving into the next election cycle is this weaponization, this cross-platform weaponization. Like I've got a, well, all three of my boys were huge Minecraft guys, right? All of them. And so that was really, to your point, where I really watched my kids was Twitch, Discord. That's where I was most nervous about, where, about who they were talking to, um, what, who was on their servers. My son would be like, oh no, it's a private server, we built it. I'm like, okay, who's on it, right? Well, this is Zeb99, I'm like, who is that? It's like, I don't know, you know, but it's a private server, right? 
So, I mean, that's, that, is, that is volatile. Um, but I do think that there are people like Carrie Goldberg, you know, there are people in Child Protective Services, there are people in law enforcement that are doing a really good job with this stuff right now. Um, but certainly that's probably the area I'm most nervous about moving in to 2020, you know, the back end of this year and into 2024 in the election cycle when the gloves get off and everyone, that, that side wants to, they want to activate that base as much as they can because that's how they will do it. And how YouTube comes into this, which we talk a little bit about in the film, but again, it's, a, it's, a, it's own movie, is a lot of that happens in the comments section in YouTube. So YouTube's social media component, weirdly, is its comment section. Like, that's where people will congregate and where a lot of the harassment will occur and the targeting will occur and the death threats will occur. And that moves all over the place. That's like Reddit, 4chan, 8chan, YouTube. That's like this sort of moving troll swarm. Um, you know this because you encountered it. Um, and there is a way to, to, you know, the upside to the Internet is that it's, it's data, this is the pr problem we're dealing with in the labor strike right now in Hollywood, is like, the, you know, Netflix, everyone's like, oh, we can't really show you the numbers. I'm like, unlike any time in history, you could actually show us the numbers, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know who's watching, what show, for how long, where, but you could literally geotag them and you could show me like their living room. Um, and the internet's the same, right? So it's, it's, you can absolutely track that stuff. Um, and I think, you know, to the credit of, of some folks in law and law enforcement, they're doing that. But I, I don't think I agree that I do not think they're doing that enough. And I do worry about the next big violent cataclysm like J6 or the like um, that comes as a result of that kind of, of community organizing. Because it is being intentionally weaponized now, for yeah. sure. Yeah, just to briefly add, so I think this cross-platform... Uh, Synergy is, is actually, and, and uh, networking to some extent, and, and, and the linking across different platforms to leverage influence is actually really uh, underappreciated. So, you know, in my area where we try to quantify the influence of disinformation on the individual, uh, I think that to some extent, my worry is that we actually hugely, you know, some people are like, oh, fake news, you know, and, and so, you know, what is it really, what is it really doing, and so on. And I think to some extent, we're, we're massively underestimating the influence of disinformation on people because most of the research is done only on the apps that have even limited publicly available data that can be scraped to quantify, right? Um, YouTube actually does not release any of its behavioral data of what we don't know. You can say, oh, f fake news, Twitter, this and that, but we don't know what the thousands of hours that people are watching on YouTube, how that's impacting the individual, what they're doing on, on Instagram, on Reddit, on Parler, on cable TV. Um, it's actually very difficult to try to create a comprehensive estimate of all the disinformation across all the platforms somebody receives. And if you don't have a good, if it's not transparent and predicting things like the Capitol riot, when there is an uptick, when different platforms are mobilizing people, that becomes actually quite, quite difficult. Um, and so especially YouTube has been very untransparent uh, in terms of, you know, its data. Similar to, to Netflix, right? They have the data. And when you talk to the companies, they'll say, well, they're privacy issues, so we don't look at it. Or we don't have the manpower to actually do that because it would take huge amounts of manpower. Or, to there's corporate, or they'll be honest and say, it's we don't want Apple to know what our numbers exactly. are. We don't want yeah. Amazon to yeah. know what our numbers right. are. Right. Our competitor will will attack us based on, you know, the general belief in Hollywood right now during the strike is that the streamers, nobody watches this stuff, right? <laughs> they basically just cratered the industry and other than succession, nobody really watched TV last year at all. Um, which is maybe an element of truth, but, um, but I think, I don't know how, and I wouldn't drag you into this publicly, but I don't know how you ended up dealing with your situation, but I've talked to a lot of people um, who, were har who were harassed um, to a, a grave degree and it seems like one of the most effective ways of dealing with it is, is litigation, even on a small level, is literally suing every single person, every single technology platform involved. Now you have to know you're probably not going to win. You're gonna attract more hate, more death threats. You're putting yourself, I mean, it's like the Me Too era, right? Everyone's like, well, why didn't they come and talk earlier? And then as soon as they open their mouth, they're just <laughs> completely abused all over again. 
Um, so that's not an easy place to go, but well, like the work Carrie Goldberg is doing and people like her in New York, where they're just like, no, we're literally just gonna open a lawsuit, we're gonna sue you, we're gonna sue you, we're gonna take you to court over and over and over again. Um, and the public does begin to get wind of the severity of the issue, but I'm not cavalier about people doing that because it is an extremely vulnerable and potentially dangerous position to put yourself in. All right, but uh, please, if we could keep it brief, because we have a few other hands up already. Uh, so we want to give everyone. Yeah, a so I, I'm not going to do that. I'm an impoverished student at the moment, so no. But but I that people have told me that as an option. But just quickly, um, because we talk about January 6, and and as a member of Twitter's council from the very beginning, in 2016, when President Trump was talking about building the wall in 2017, I was one of those people in the council that said. So people of the blue tick, the ver to be verified, the idea was that public figures should be held more accountable, a greater level of accountability than everybody else, because we could foresee that people who are like him, who are influencers, w can cause such damage to society. And so when January 6 mm. happened, we were not surprised, yeah. but we were appalled. And I, I was ashamed that I had did not resign then or before then, but, um, the, mm. but I wanted to explain to the public what it actually meant, like what we were trying to do up to that point in time. It was just appalling. Yeah, well, it was unprecedented, so. <clears throat> thanks. Uh, great film. Thanks for sharing. Um, I was wondering if you would expand on what you think the antitrust solution would look like, just because it strikes me that, you know, the di these digital platforms are very different than, like, physical goods, like railway railroads back in the day. And there's nothing, in theory, preventing a YouTube competitor from propping up. I'm sure many companies have tried over the last 20 years, but it's like the breadth of these platforms that really matter. So even if we get rid of YouTube, if we break up YouTube, would it just lead to one of those parties still rising to the cream again and having YouTube part two? Look, there is no part of me that thinks that this is an easy or quick solution. Um, however, sort of like to the point we were talking about earlier with Sander, I don't think it gets talked about enough, the, the difference in terms of scale uh, and how that relates to influence. You know, to the point here, you know, Trump says something to his base with 4.6 billion views a day via YouTube. That's just an enormous amount of scale. And if Steven Crowder, after the FBI shows up at Mar-a-Lago to you know, kindly request their classified documents back out of Trump's bathroom, and Crowder goes on YouTube to his millions and millions of ad-backed followers and calls for civil war, that just has humongous scale. So I don't believe for a second that if you broke up YouTube, you'd have another YouTube next week. You know, I think that the the it can't be discounted that YouTube is really just Google's media front end. They go to great efforts to separate the companies on a superficial level, but they're not separate. They're just, they are owned and run by Google, which is the largest tech company on the planet in terms of, of its user interaction, right? I mean, Apple's got a bigger market cap, I guess, but there are way more people engaging with Google products than Apple products. And that's not my car because I didn't drive here. Um, <laughs> The, uh, that's a New Yorker for you. Whenever you hear a horn, like, oh, I'll be right back. I don't want to get towed. Um, so uh, uh, that's just, I don't think you can discount that. This, and that's why I relate it back to the sort of big tobacco standard oil uh, analogies from the last industrial age. It isn't to say we can do the same thing, wave a wand and just fix it. It's to say that we're in a completely untenable situation with a, with a very small amount of companies that are way too big, that are not easily, I mean, everyone's talking about TikTok. TikTok has a lot of influence. There are way less people watching TikTok than YouTube every day. So I do think scale matters, and I think the size of Google matters, and I think having companies that aren't that big is important. Um, and I do think that eventually that will get worked out. I don't, I don't think there's some magic antitrust law that exists right now, which is why I keep saying I don't see any change at all of any substance for probably 15 to 20 years even right which is why like the kind of work sanders doing and people who are either suing these companies uh to whatever effect doing you know verifiable peer-reviewed 
studies with people that are showing where the harms are, how to deal with dealing with, as I said, we were talking about this earlier, dealing with these issues, behavioral issues, because there are solutions to behavioral issues, as opposed to just saying it's an algorithm, let's all go home, because none of us know what that means, like what we're doing with AI right now. So I just think we have to help each other get this, these tech companies accountable and work towards whatever form of, of law is going to help break them up. My, my concern is that no one knows what the truth is or where to get facts. And we're, because of so much misinformation, we're losing, the average person is losing trust in experts, they're losing trust in science, they're losing trust in, you know, anyone who doesn't already um, uh, propound what that particular person already believes. So they are, are simply looking for validation. And there have been many studies that have shown that, you know, people will read an article by an expert. And, l l you know, not every expert is right. Um, but, you know, they've spent a lot of time, like many of you in this room, studying something, doing the research, reading all sides, having data. And people will read the article, disagree with it, and then look at the comments to find someone who's just like them, who has no expertise at all, and they will not remember the article or what was in the article. They will then go and tell their friends that, and they will, and they will opine about this comment from someone who has no expertise whatsoever. And I, and I think, to me, that is one of the things, in addition to the violence, in addition to the divisiveness, it's that no one knows who to trust anymore. And, um, you know, we, we've seen through the pandemic, we've seen through so many things um, that the average person really, they don't trust the news, they don't trust media, probably rightly, um, but who is someone going to trust and how do we, how do all of us regain trust? Um, because it, without something being flagged as misinformation or disinformation, it, it's a free-for-all. Though, yeah, I do think that, I mean, the, the sort of gallowsy, morbid way to, to progress is just more casualties, you know, is like, you know, what happened in, in, in England with, with Brexit, um, where sort of, you know, a disinfo campaign with a very specific agenda drove the country into an economic freefall. And in the U.S. with Dobbs, uh, where women on both sides of the aisle found themselves without reproductive rights anymore. Um, so those kinds of, that kind of bloodshed, um, either literal or economic, wakes a lot of people up. And uh, in the U.S., you know, the reason I'm even vaguely optimistic about our future, even though I think our short-term future is a little is kind of on the ropes <laughs> at the moment, but um, is, you know, that Dobbs woke a lot of people up in the U.S. that were eating up a lot of, a lot of really horrible... For those of you who don't know, it's the one that reversed Roe v. Wade. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah, sorry, shorthand. I'm, I'm a little tired, I'm jet lagged. Um, but... Uh, but you know, that did that shifted things in the U.S. because people who were, like to Gail's point, sort of like at the barbecue with their friends, sort of spouting what they kind of maybe half-heartedly knew was nonsense, woke up without reproductive rights. And you know, our our countries, they're not stopping. They're trying to push for much more draconian legislation, um, some of which will probably pass. So I think that you end up with the kind of, you know, I don't care about gay rights until my, my son wants to get married to his boyfriend who I really like because he's a super nice guy and suddenly I care about gay rights, which is basically what's happened in our country. I mean, it's, it's appalling, but um, that will drive change because facts are facts. And there are, you know, to the point about the censorship thing, there's a huge line between the, the things that are hard to know whether it's true or not, and just the utter agenda-ridden bullshit that people are accepting um, on a daily basis that will cause them harm. And I think, okay, well, if you're going to have harm caused to you, then that might wake you up a little bit. Question here. Um, well, I work at a research center um, that has been discussing antitrust and big tech since about 2017. So, um, two questions. Um, the first 
So, so because of that, I'm, I'm quite close to these issues, and I found the documentary still, um, like, sh shocking in a way. You know, like, some of the things that, that you... I, so the question is the creative decisions to show the clips that you showed, because I think, I don't know about the people sitting in here, but there were times when I was sort of uncomfortable just being faced with what I cerebrally know is out there, but having it shown in the documentary um, was jarring to somebody who, who actually knows the facts. So that's the first question. And then the second question um, is more about antitrust, which... Okay, well, the second one I probably won't be able to answer. You can probably just get up and just give me the answer because you'll know way better than I will. But um, on the first one, yes, that's why we make films, right? Films have, are, have enormous impact and they have profound emotional impact. And seeing a group of human beings, real flesh and blood, blood people, you know, our docs tend to focus on just a core group of on, an ensemble cast. They're very specifically sought out. Um, and those are the stories that we're telling. You know, I had a, a, a friend of mine from Google who's pretty high up the food chain. A lot of people from Google have really liked the movie, which has been nice, to be honest with you. It's been a bit of a relief. But um, I think she, was, she had the same reaction you did, where she was like, I was there for 20 years. I love the place. It means a lot to me. I know intellectually all the things you're talking about but that movie completely freaked me out right and that's that's like job done right that's that's what we want to do and it's not to be you know shocking or provocative for but it's just to say look these are there's human costs like i was saying about dobbs like you can talk all day like they do in the u.s about gun violence right like it ain't the guns right and then you're you're now everyone's child has had a, a, a shooter at their school doesn't matter what side of the aisle they're on you know, and then you're like, oh shit, <laughs> guns are not great. Like, I don't want my son's face to get blown off at school. Uh, so I think there's that human element, and I think docs are very effective. I mean, movies in general are very effective in that way. I think you have to be careful. We work really hard to not be, you know, propagandistic or didactic. You know, even like handling Stephen and Susan, like, just let them say what they're going to say. I don't need to, like, jump down their throat. Like, they're going to represent what they represent. I'm going to let them. You know, I have specific questions that are going to go in specific directions, but just want to hear how they're going to respond to these things, right? Um, so I think we work really hard to not sort of say this is the answer. Um, I don't feel like I've got the answer, like even within the antitrust stuff. Like I don't see, like as like a punter sitting at home, like shaking my fist, I don't see how else we get there without companies this big being less big. Um, but I have no illusions about that or content moderation. I have no illusions that these things are easy and that we're not gonna make all kinds of mistakes as we try to fix this stuff. And then one question in the back. We have time for one or two more questions before we can sort of bring the session to the end. Uh, do you have the, yeah, so, yeah, do you have the microphone? I think someone else has it. Yeah, we can take the two Go ahead. together. So it's, um, I have a question on the behavioral aspect. How can we change it? If from a regulations perspective, it's hard to change, you know, antitrust is 15, 20 years down the line. Like I, I was just like from a, I did the experiment because I was a bit fed up with the YouTube um, feed I was getting and I just deleted my historical feed. And then I was like, I had to remember, okay, this was the YouTuber I like to follow or not. But if you ask viewers every six months, do you want still to be on the same historical feed for your recommended viewing, like would that kind of deprogram the viewers themselves? At least they have to remember what they want to be, what they what would be, what content they want to face. Sandra, you want it to seems to be easy. So why isn't it done? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, there are certain features like this. So Instagram does experiment with uh, uh, asking people if they're still enjoying uh, the content that they're experiencing. Kind of like Netflix. <laughs> the, I'm not sure if I'm, the, if I'm the only one who gets these warnings about, are you, do you still want to continue watching? Um, and so, you know, that, that's the, there are experimenting with these things. Like, oh, you've been in this echo chamber for quite a while now. Are you, do you still want to continue? So they do prompt people. But, you know, there is a concern that people get desensitized to, to these prompts um, and they're not done consistently. They're kind of experimenting with, with that to, to try to take in 
other signals than just the observed behavior. So they're trying to ask people sort of in the moment to try to use that as an additional signal. Um, but I think there's also a lack of awareness about how the algorithms work. I mean, lots of people on Twitter don't know that you can flip back between what's recommended for you uh, versus your actual following. And sometimes I even, I ask myself, why am I getting this shit? Um, and it's sort of like, yeah. And it's I've like, been oh, on it for like 12 years, and I still <laughs> forget. Uh, so because, oh yeah, they yeah. flipped me back to the, uh, to the algorithm. Yeah. And so, why and, am I looking at cat turds tweets? Look what, <laughs> what happened. Cat, exactly. Cat yeah. Well, cat turds everywhere. Yeah. And so he's promoted by Musk. And so, the, and this is, um, so yeah, I would say, you know, that, that is definitely something exploring. But I think, we, you know, they need more uh, serious behavioral solutions. One thing we've been wondering and, and talking to them about is this idea of, of a credibility index. Uh, and, you know, you don't want to put it all on the end user, but to some extent, the incentive needs to be so that what they're incentivizing is not extremist uh, misinformation. They want to incentivize accurate content that helps people build credible, trustworthy reputations with their social media accounts. Um, so people do care about their reputation, and we know people care about incentives. I mean, there are going to be people who are going to be complaining about the score and disregarding it and so on. But uh, maybe on the whole, it would be an interesting idea to attach credibility meters to, to, to people's accounts. And the input for that could be, I don't know, you could have 50 different independent fact checkers to satisfy everyone's concerns about you know, what's, uh, who's determining credibility. Because that's the question social media companies will ask. So, okay, we can do that, but then who, who determines what is credible, what is toxic, what is polarizing? And it's like, well, I, I think we can reach some objective level consensus of what that means, uh, and people can have, can have credibility um, scores. Um, but I, you'll, you'll be surprised. This is the last thing I'll say. You know, we, together with Steve sitting over here, we've done videos for, for YouTube that pre-bunk harmful content. Um, and it took years and lots of lawyers uh, to test that. And uh, th the thing is, though, it's such an easy lift for them to make this mandatory in the ad space uh, uh, and, and scale it across billions of people because it doesn't requ require them to change their business model. So the downside of, of sometimes, and we talk about this all the time, is the downside of these individual level solutions can be we don't want to disincentivize them to, to do the hard things. But, but at the same time, we want to help people but they're still not doing it. So it's an easy lift for them. They know it works, they tested it. They're still not making it mandatory, which makes me concerned that they really have no interest in scaling you know, solutions. Uh, and they're, they're being extremely slow about it, right? It takes, it takes years, so that does concern me sometimes that there are behavioral solutions that help people that they still don't want to implement because the risk managers have concerns and, and maybe it displaces profit because instead of science in the ad space, they don't make any money off of the science in the ad space, right? They want, they want ads. Uh, and so I think they're going to have to accept maybe to me, maybe, maybe other people disagree, but to me, the, some of the solutions are that it's going to be okay if you have less engagement and less money. Um, you know, move fast and break things. Maybe we need to move slow and fix things. Yeah. Um, yeah. You should tell them that at the next board meeting. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just need to make less money. That's the you'll be fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> you have enough of it. Yeah. So if I heard correctly, you don't like the term end user. What would you replace the term end user with? And do you believe that that term has had an impact on how people view their role on social platforms? That what did uh, the term end user? It sounded like at the beginning you said you didn't like the term and you Yeah, no, I just didn't I didn't want to did, didn't want to de, it's a dehumanizing term. I don't mind it as a technical term. It's it's accurate. Like I, there's I don't mind algorithms. There there are such things as algorithms. Um, I was just in the context that I was describing it, I don't like this idea that the that the people who are absorbing all of this media um, are this kind of data point, right? Cuz they're just, they're people and, uh, and I think that those people deserve to have the, the media that they're consuming, uh, just like the television, um, you know, have basic standards and practices that, that are protective of those people. The end user, uh, sort of the term, you know, it, you're not using anything, right? The, the user is the, is the platform, right? Um, uh, I mean, you could argue the end user is actually the platform. Uh, I mean, the, the, there's a person on the other end there that is watching this stuff, and they, that stuff is being 
given to them with a certain incentives and it should be, they should be better protected. I think that's my point. Yeah, I don't have issues with technical terms. I get, I get ruffled a little bit by the, the, the agenda behind the use of them. The, you know, there's an agenda behind these tech companies talking about the algorithm, the algorithm, because they know that 99.9% .9 of the populace's eyes glaze over when they heard the, hear the word the algorithm, and they assert, assume these platforms are black boxes, and they're going to go back home and tell their child to put down that damn iPad, because there's an algorithm on that iPad that's going to turn it into a satanic robot. And the truth is, no, there's just a person running that platform who's making lots of money off of a lot of content that may hurt that kid. Um, and I think that's a better way of looking at it. In AI right now, there was a great article in The Guardian about, about all of this narrative around, oh, AI is going to kill everyone on the planet, right? AI is the end of the world. And there's an agenda with that. Because again, it's so, it's, so, it's so overwhelming that you just say, oh, the hell with it. I'm just going to go to bed, as opposed to saying, Who's running these companies? Do they have an anti-woman or anti-Muslim or anti-LGBTQ agenda? Are there aspects to AI that are like inherently biased? Oh, why, yes, there are. So maybe we should look at that instead of the fact that the world's going to end. So there are agendas to this rhetoric, which is why they, they ruffle me. All right, we have time for one last uh, quick question. OK, keep it brief so that we can end on time. Thank you. I think this guy's been trying to ask a question since the movie ended. Uh, hey guys, hey Alex, hey Gail, this is awesome. Uh, first off, uh, what a great film, really super propulsive, super engaging. Uh, my first question, because there are two parts, they're both good, but there are two of them. Uh, the first question is, um, you know, having worked on a few documentaries myself, it's more of a filmmaker question rather than like a finance or like a disinformation one. but. Um, you know, there are a billion different ways it seems to make a documentary. You can have a plan, it's changing, or you don't have one at all. Kind of figure it out as you go along. Uh, what were the, some of the first things that you wrote down? And uh, did, you, did you know you were building up to that ending? And if not, when did you realize that? And the second one um, is for uh, Bill Esquire. And uh, <laughs> I fully understand if you've left the We're going to get out of here with that. But uh, would you indulge me with a three-second air guitar solo, potentially? Oh, no, that's definitely not <laughs> happening. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'll take question one. Um, uh, no, you, I mean, you, I, don't, I think you're doing yourself a huge disservice if you go into a doc knowing exactly what you're going to do. Um, I, you know, I, I write, so I, I tend to write a lot at the beginning. Um, and I'll write sort of three act structures of what I think would, could work. And gener, genu, generally why I do that is so that because docs are made or the way we make them anyway at my company is, is everything goes at once. Editorial, production, meaning of the shoot, and research. So my research department's filling drives with media while my editor's starting to build timelines out of the media while I'm going out into the field to shoot. So I have to have some kind of framework, like where are we going? Like what's our act one, what's our act two, act three, knowing it's, it's going to change. Um, I think as we said at the beginning, what happened here was we were shooting clean through the, you know, the, the end of the election, COVID, insanity, QAnon, crazy, like that began to, and also we were finding things out. Someone from Bellingcat is here. Like once we found out, once we got the results of that Bellingcat study, which I kind of, I kind of had a hunch this was the case, but to see in hard data that YouTube had had a larger impact on influencing the insurrectionists of the January 6th attack than any other platform, then I was like, okay, our third act is about J6 and about the aftermath of J6. And, and social media and technology's role in real world violence of a political nature. It's not just random violence. It's, it is it is ideologically funded, driven, coordinated violence using a monetizable platform with billions of eyeballs to get a certain result. Once we saw the, the numbers it just in black and white from a verifiable source like Bellingcat, our whole back end shifted in terms of what we were doing and even who we were talking to. Um, because it became about verifying that and then communicating that. Because that's really, I think, that's really, from a narrative standpoint, that's kind of where everything goes. There, there was an intention that 
hopefully everyone noticed, to make sure that YouTube was able to weigh in on these things. Um, there, are, there are other documentarians who really want to just, they have an agenda, they know what their agenda is going in, and, and essentially they, they, want to, um, they want to disregard everything else. And we felt it was very important since the intention of the documentary was to show YouTube starting with, you know, with people wanting to create like a better version of hot or not and ending up with the most significant media platform um, in the world today. How did that happen? And what are the aspects that have benefited? I'm like, you know, like Natalie Wynn is, is one. There, you know, there are others. Um, and, um, and, then, and then along the way, what happened? Um, and to let people draw their own conclusions at the end. It, it's not like we wrap everything up and say, okay, this is the summary, this is what needs to be done, because the truth is, it, there's no way that we know. It's too early. I mean, that's sort of how we end and, it, and right? It's, yes. too, it's too early to know and all the of solutions. you are working concretely. on that. Yeah. Um, and, and we really, you know, people say to, to us, what's your call to action? Like every documentary needs to have a call to action. Yeah. Well, it is sunlight's the best disinfectant. So let's at least make people aware of what's going on. And then people smarter and better equipped than us can come up with solutions. Yeah. And also you get engaged by questions, right? I think that that's, that's the power of documentaries. I think that you want to raise, like I said at the intro, like I had a fundamental question going in. Now I've got more questions. That's good. That's a good thing, right? Um, when the audience walks out with, with a lot of questions, I think that's, that's good. And they've been activated and they've been not like you have the power to self-empower them, but you have like the respect of your audience to self-empower them, right? Like go forth, do your thing. You know, this is another narrative to now add to your, your world of narratives that you can hopefully deal with. And because I've done so many politically oriented docs and, and that often have these kind of conundrum -y issues, like the Panama Papers one we did where, where, you know, 700 journalists around the world uncovering the biggest, you know, flow of, of secret money on the planet that connects Assad and Putin and our government and your government all together. And everyone was like, well, you know, you made this movie, but like, now what, right? Well, that was like, now what is like, I'm going to throw that back to you, right? Like, now what? Now what are we going to do? So um, I think that's kind of a big motivator because I think there is huge power in in, you know, the civic populace is really where the power is. And like to answer all these questions about antitrust or sort of where this is going, like these are the questions that we now have to work out. And we've got to get ourselves into positions of power within government and law to be able to enact these changes. I can tell you from having to spoke, spoken to many people within our government, many of whom I like and are very, very smart, they do not understand the shit at all. Like at all, at all. And then there's huge lobbying power, so they're incentivized to not understand it. But boy, do they not understand it. So, like, we need a whole new generation of people to come up and in who absolutely understand how these things work that can begin to uh, come up with solutions. All right. I believe we're out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank Alex, Gail, and Sandra again. And thank you all for being thank such all a of brilliant you. audience. Yeah. Thank you so much.